In our discussion of gastrointestinal tract infections, we come to the very large topic of infectious diarrhea and food poisoning. We would certainly define it as the acute onset of excessive bowel movements caused either directly or indirectly by microbial pathogens. It's got a tremendous impact on the world. It's the second leading cause of morbidity and mortality with 3 million deaths a year, and that's more than 8,400 a day. And unfortunately, it affects our young children in developing countries. And the main reason for that is that they don't have a lot of fluid to start with. And so if they start losing a lot of fluid, they lose a lot of blood volume and they can get sick in a hurry. Diarrhea is a thousandfold higher in developing countries than in the United States. But it still is a problem in the United States with 179 million cases a year, 17 million of which are foodborne. About 2 million of those instances require hospitalization. 3,000 deaths is a sizable amount and most of the deaths occur among elderly persons. And if you tally the cost, it's six billion in medical care and lost productivity every year. So if you're talking about organisms per 100,000 population, Salmonella leads the list, followed by Campylobacter, Shigatoxin producing E. coli, Vibrio, and Yersinia. So Salmonella is quite a big problem in the United States. More about that later. Then as far as the causes of acute bacterial diarrhea, if you're talking about international travel, we're talking about these organisms. E. coli, the cause of turista, some people call it Montezuma's revenge, some people call it the green apple quick step. There are many names for it. One of my colleagues says, travel broadens the mind and loosens the bowels. And then it's a problem in people who work in daycare centers. And obviously it's a problem among food handlers. Well, of course, diarrhea is a pretty common disorder in everybody. Most everybody gets an occasional episode of diarrhea every year. And we don't need medical evaluation for that. So when does a person with diarrhea actually need to see a physician? Well, that would certainly be for profuse watery diarrhea with hypovolemia. In other words, the patient has such volume depletion that when they stand up, they feel dizzy or feel like they're gonna faint. Certainly somebody who has diarrhea along with definite fever, say greater than 38.5 Celsius, or if they've had diarrhea that's been lasting more than 48 hours, they probably need to be evaluated. A baby with diarrhea because they have such little blood volume anyway need to be evaluated as do elderly folks. And let's say a patient who has Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis and they often have diarrhea, let's say they get another episode of diarrhea. Is it the underlying illness or is it some infectious disease problem? We need to know and they need to be evaluated. Somebody with severe abdominal pain, uh, that is not common in most benign causes of diarrhea. And then someone who has had recent antibiotic treatment for any reason, there's a concern for this organism called Clostridium difficile, uh, which can cause a very severe form of antibiotic-associated diarrhea, which can progress to colitis, which can even progress to toxic megacolon and death. So we need to know if that's there and that's causing the diarrhea. And then the immunocompromised patient, the classic example would be the AIDS patient, with diarrhea because they may have an unusual organism causing their diarrhea, which requires a rather unusual treatment. So more about the clinical features. 
we need to discern what medications the patient may be receiving. For example, chemotherapy itself, if you know about cancer chemotherapy, uh, it goes after rapidly proliferating tissue. Well, the GI tract has a rapid turnover rate. So you can imagine that diarrhea is a common complication of cancer chemotherapy. So we need to know about that kind of history. We need to know about the sexual history. Uh, we talked about some of the sexually transmitted diseases which can be associated with GI symptoms. And we need to know about whether patients have pets. There are some zoonotic infections that can be spread from pets to humans. And we need to know uh, whether patients are receiving any kind of medications. Now, to figure out what the cause of the diarrhea is, it's useful to know about the onset. So if we're talking about food poisoning, that usually comes on pretty rapidly, usually within two to seven hours. And vomiting is predominant uh, in food poisoning. And the classic one, perhaps the most rapid one, is that caused by staphylococcus, the enterotoxins of staphylococcus comes on faster than about any form of food poisoning. So we need to know about the recent consumption of things that might have staphylococci in them, like chocolate eclairs, like mayonnaise, like chicken salad uh, at picnics and things of that nature. We need to know about the duration of symptoms, the stool frequency and the characteristics. Is the patient having small volume stools containing blood and mucus? That suggests an invasive pathogen. We need to know about the presence of severe abdominal pain, as we mentioned. On physical examination, we want to look for evidence of volume depletion. For example, decreased skin turgor. Sometimes it can be pretty subtle. And so what you want to do with a typical patient is grasp uh, say a centimeter of their skin, pinch it together a little gently and see if it stays up, if it sort of tents, that would be evidence of decreased skin turgor. We need to look at the mucous membranes. Are they dry? The other thing that a lot of people forget to check for is orthostatic hypotension. A patient may come into the emergency room and they're on a stretcher. Well, we take their blood pressure and it might read 120 over 80 on a stretcher, but if you crank the head of the stretcher up, say 30 degrees, you may find that the blood pressure then drops to 90 over 70, which is an indication of orthostatic hypotension and rather significant volume depletion. Obviously, we'll check their temperature, and we would hate to miss something like acute appendicitis or other peritoneal signs. And by the way, it's hard to evaluate children for peritonitis, but uh, if a child comes into the emergency room uh, and they won't let you examine them, sometimes if you have them simply jump off a, a small step, if that causes belly pain when they jump down one step, that child may well have peritonitis, just a little trick for evaluating toddlers. So if they have fever and peritoneal signs and diarrhea, then that's a, usually indicating invasive bugs and invasive enteric pathogen. So when should you go ahead and culture the stool? Well, as I mentioned, in immunocompromised patients, for example, AIDS, we would want to know what is growing in the stool. Patients who have other comorbidities, particularly diabetics, patients with ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, we need to distinguish, as I mentioned, infection from a flare of their disease. Food handlers may be required to get a stool culture to prove that the pathogen is no longer there so that they can return to work. Healthcare workers, for the same reason, it would be sad for a healthcare worker to pass on a cause of diarrhea to one of the, their sick patients. 
Same thing goes for daycare attendees or employees and institutionalized persons because there are certain causes of diarrhea that run rampant in institutions. Now, if a physician decides that a stool culture is indicated, it is very helpful to the laboratory if the physician will specifically request culturing for a suspected pathogen that helps the lab uh, isolate the right bug. So what's in the differential diagnosis of infectious causes of diarrhea? Well, one of them is ischemic bowel disease. We find that among the elderly. Some patients are actually sort of addicted to laxatives. Uh, you can have diarrhea with partial bowel obstruction, with Whipple disease. It's pretty rare, but you can have it with pernicious anemia. Uh, there is such a thing among diabetics as diabetic visceroenteropathy, and some patients have uh, nocturnal diarrhea. And that's a, a, an interesting and good question to ask a, a, a diabetic. Do you have to get up at night uh, to have a diarrhea stool? Persons who have disorders that cause malabsorption, small bowel diverticulosis, some connective tissue diseases like scleroderma are associated with enteropathy. Celiac sprue from gluten intolerance. And then ulcerative colitis and Crohn disease. So how do we classify diarrhea? We need to decide whether it's watery diarrhea, whether it's acute dysentery, or whether it's something like typhoid fever, enteric fever. So let's talk first about watery diarrhea and talk about some of the characteristics. Patients who have most forms of watery diarrhea do not have fever. And ordinarily, this is a disorder that has a short incubation, one to six hours, uh, especially if there's preformed toxin present in the food. And as I mentioned earlier, vomiting is more prominent in that type of food poisoning, but watery diarrhea certainly can occur. Then there is the longer incubation form of watery diarrhea with an incubation of eight to 16 hours. And they ingested the organism, but the organism didn't make its toxin until after it got into the body. Vomiting would be less prominent and abdominal cramps are quite prominent. And by the way, uh, a good physician, just doctor to doctor, a good physician should uh, ask about the cramps. Are the cramps located in the periumbilical region? If so, that points to a small bowel cause of diarrhea. On the other hand, if the cramps are below the umbilicus in the hypogastric region, that's a point in favor of large bowel causes of diarrhea. And then we ought to ask about the volume of the diarrhea. So you need to find out from the patient how many times a day are you having diarrhea and is it a large volume or just a small volume? It turns out that causes of watery diarrhea are characterized by large volume diarrhea. As a matter of fact, sometimes they have so much diarrhea, watery in nature, that they can't hold it. And a question you might ask the patient would be, uh, Mrs. Jones, have you ever had an accident on yourself because of your diarrhea? And then obviously, signs and symptoms of, of dehydration like excessive thirst. So when would you need to do a stool exam? Well, obviously in those patients who have a severe form, and what you're looking for in the stool in patients with watery diarrhea is you're making sure that there are no white cells in the stool or that you're lactoferrin, which is a test for the evidence of white cells in stool. You wanna make sure they don't have that because most forms of watery diarrhea do not have white cells in the stool. And uh, if, if they did have, you would start looking for a more invasive type of pathogen. So here's a short list of the pathogens that can cause 
watery diarrhea. The most prominent about, uh, among them is Vibrio cholerae, the cause of cholera. And then there are a whole series of Escherichia coli organisms that can cause watery diarrhea. There is enterotoxigenic E. coli, enteropathogenic E. coli, enteroaggregative E. coli, and diffusely adherent E. coli. They all look alike under the microscope. Then there's Clostridium perfringens, which can cause a form of watery diarrhea. If you remember, other Clostridia make toxin, like Clostridium botulinum, so it shouldn't surprise you that Clostridium perfringens can make a bowel toxin. And then Bacillus cereus uh, is a cause of watery diarrhea. So let's talk about cholera caused by Vibrio cholerae, which is really the prototype of watery diarrhea. And it's got a prototypic AB toxin. The A subunit is what's causing the disease. The B subunit is really what binds the toxin to the GI epithelium. So here's what happens. This B subunit is trying to bind the gastrointestinal mucosa, small bowel. And it forms a pentameric ring and binds the toxin to an enterocyte receptor. And that enterocyte receptor is a GM1 gangliocide on the mucosal cell surface. And what that B subunit does in its pentameric ring is actually forms a pore in the cell. And that allows the, to the active component, the toxin, to get in. Now, cholera, it seems kind of complicated if you look at this slide, but let me sort of uh, gradually walk you through it. So you know that the B subunit causes this pore uh, and binds the cholera toxin to the cell. And then the toxin enters the cell and it actually enters the endoplasmic reticulum retrograde. The toxin then interacts with ADP ribosylation factor to activate the stimulatory protein GS-alpha. And what that does is stimulates the release of adenyl cyclase. And so what you get is marked increases in the cell of cyclic AMP. And if you get large increases of cyclic AMP, what that does is cause the release of chloride ions into the lumen. And of course, sodium follows chloride. And what you get is a massive watery osmotic diuresis. And in summary, that's the way cholera toxin works. So the typical patient with cholera has unbelievably severe frequent watery diarrhea, up to a liter an hour. And the stool is essentially liquid without much odor after a few stools, and it has no blood, no pus, and the stool has been described as appearing like rice water. But with one liter an hour of diarrhea, you can imagine how rapidly somebody becomes dehydrated, and of course, their blood pressure takes a nosedive. So they may lose up to six liters in an hour in the most severe cases, and the organisms are present in the stool. You can actually see them on a gram stain. And patients have lost more than 10% of their body weight, and obviously that leads to dehydration and shock, death within 12 hours or less, occasionally within two to three hours. So we've got to take fast action if we're trying to treat somebody with cholera. And so what we've got to do is rapidly replace fluids. If they have a milder version, we can try oral uh, with sodium chloride and some sugar. But more often than not, they will need IV fluids. And the classic one used is Ringer's lactate. 
because it's got sodium, potassium, chloride, and similar concentrations as plasma, plus some calcium and some lactate. To kill the bug, we can use azithromycin or a fluoroquinolone or doxycycline. It is also important to mention that in June 2016, Vaxcora, a live attenuated oral cholera vaccine, was approved by the FDA for prevention of cholera caused by a serogroup O1 in adults 18 through 64 years of age traveling to affected areas. Let's go back to E. coli again and talk about Turista. This actually resembles cholera in sort of a milder form. It's not invasive like the cholera. And what happens is the fimbriae of E. coli, the enterotoxigenic E. coli, uh, will adhere to the brush border of the intestine. And this organism makes two types of toxin. It makes a heat labile enterotoxin, so-called LT, labile toxin. And the way that works is very, very similar to cholera. It increases cellular cyclic AMP and produces watery diarrhea in the same way. It's just not as severe as cholera. Then there's heat stable toxin, or ST, and that increases cellular cyclic GMP, the same result, watery diarrhea. And these are plasmid encoded toxins. So Turista has a short incubation. It's got a rapid onset of symptoms. Nausea and vomiting are really not that common. Nausea maybe, but vomiting not that common. But cramps galore, and sometimes large volume and fecal incontinence. And the cramps would be in around the periumbilical area. And the watery diarrhea can be mild to severe. There's no blood in a case of turista and no tenesmus. Now this word may not be familiar to you, but tenesmus uh, is hard to describe, it's either rectal pain, sometimes severe, or it's the constant feeling around the rectum of the urgency to defecate. That's called tenesmus. And the reason I'm making a point about that is because this is a helpful sign to distinguish watery diarrhea from invasive colitis. And then we mention fecal incontinence. Now, there's some other E. coli's that can produce watery diarrhea, but they do it by a different mechanism. For example, enteropathogenic E. coli. What this co does is attaches to the epithelial cells and alters the tight junctions between the cells and alters their physiologic function, leading to problems with ion transport. And it's kind of a malabsorption uh, form of watery diarrhea. And it does promote somewhat of an inflammatory response and may cause apoptosis of the cells or direct cell killing. So where do we find enteropathogenic E. coli? Well, the outbreaks are common in newborns. These kids often have a little bit of low-grade fever. Vomiting is actually more common with enteropathogenic E. coli and watery diarrhea, uh, and it's not usually as voluminous. Then there's this enteroaggregative E. coli, which is an emerging pathogen, not that common, and these organisms adhere to the epithelial cells and they aggregate with one another and they cause sort of effacement of the microvilli, mucosal damage, and of course, that will ultimately cause cell death, uh, and it causes more of a malabsorption. And so this would be the, one of the rarer causes of acute watery diarrhea in infants, and uh, it can be a cause of persistent diarrhea with 
mucoid, watery, and even occasionally bloody stools. We find this uh, frequently in the developing world more than in the developed world. And fever is not a common association. So in summary, the pathogens that cause watery diarrhea are gonna do some damage to the microvilli or to the cell membrane in the small intestine. Watery diarrhea comes from generally the small intestine. Now invasive infections on the other hand affect the colon. And so one of the first ones and one of the most common ones is antibiotic associated colitis. And the main cause of this is an organism known as Clostridium difficile. And here's kind of the way it works. Down there in the dark in our intestine, many of us are actually colonized with Clostridium difficile. But the microbiome of the intestine contains millions of organisms. It's really unbelievable. There's an emerging science looking at the number of microorganisms in the gut. There are some organisms that are in the gut that we know are there by their presence of their DNA, but they've never been cultured. We don't know what they're doing there. So back to Clostridium difficile. There are thousands and thousands of organisms uh, like anaerobes by a thousand to one over aerobes. There's also streptococci, enterococci. So it's a mixed flora <clears throat> and Clostridium difficile is one of those mixed flora. So if a patient gets an antibiotic, particularly one that's broad spectrum and that hits anaerobes, it may be that Clostridium difficile is not sensitive to that antibiotic. In other words, as I say, Clostridium difficile laughs at that antibiotic. So the other bugs nearby are killed by the antibiotic and nature abhors a vacuum. So the Clostridium difficile are encouraged to grow because there's nothing keeping their growth down. The other organisms aren't there. And so Clostridium difficile overgrows in the face of antibiotic therapy. Well, I've already told you that Clostridium botulinum makes a toxin, that Clostridium perfringens makes a toxin, uh, that Clostridium tetani makes a toxin. So are you surprised that Clostridium difficile makes a toxin? Well, it does, and that toxin can injure the bowel. And that's how it causes diarrhea. Now let's talk about the antibiotics that we need to worry about. The ones that seem to be frequently linked to antibiotic associated colitis are ampicillin and amoxicillin, the cephalosporins, the cl clindamycin, and particularly the fluoroquinolones. And these organisms are fairly broad spectrum. Less frequently, we talk about the tetracyclines, sulfonamides, erythromycin. We don't use much chloramphenicol in the, in the United States anymore and trimethoprim. And I'll start out by saying that I have never recognized antibiotic colitis due to an aminoglycoside. The aminoglycosides like genomycin essentially only hit aerobic gram-negative rods for all practical purposes. And it must be as rare as hen's teeth for metronidazole to cause antibiotic colitis because metronidazole and vancomycin are two of the treatments we use to kill Clostridium difficile. So I've never seen it, but it's on the list as a rare cause. Now this organism, Clostridium difficile, like other Clostridia, is a spore-forming organism. So when it falls upon hard times, even in the intestine, it may form spores which allow it to survive under environmental circumstances that are unfavorable to the organism. And it's these spores uh, that can be ingested uh, and also can disseminate 
And that dissemination sometimes takes place even in the hospital. And they can colonize the surface when antibiotics have altered their colonization resistance. So let's say somebody is receiving an antibiotic that even works against Clostridium difficile. Well, the organism may form spores. And the spores are essentially impervious even to antibiotics that kill Clostridium difficile. So in the hospital, if someone has antibiotic colitis caused by this bacterium, we need to isolate the patient. So barrier precautions are needed. So this organism makes essentially three toxins. It makes an A toxin, TCDA, which would be toxin of Clostridium difficile A, TCDB, and it's really the B toxin that's the bad boy. It, it's a thousand times more potent than the A toxin. And then it makes a binary toxin that uh, is uh, very mild uh, in terms of its effect on the GI mucosa. So what the toxin does is it glycosylates and inactivates GTP aces. And GTP aces are enzymes which control actin cytoskeleton of cells. If you disrupt the actin cytoskeleton, you're gonna kill the cell. You also, in killing the cells, disrupt the barrier function of the mucosa, and the cells either directly are killed or they become apoptotic. And it's no surprise that you get an inflammatory response with an infection caused by Clostridium difficile. So the toxins enter the cytoplasm. They then glycosylate the Rho B protein, which is the regulator of the actin cytoskeleton. They disrupt the actin cytoskeleton and kill the cell. So let's talk about the spectrum of disease. The expression of the disease, how severe it is, depends upon the host susceptibility or the immunity. Some strains are more virulent than others. And the timing and the type of antibiotic therapy. For instance, if you started somebody on ampicillin and they received a short course, well, Clostridium difficile may try to overgrow. But after stopping the antibiotic, the other organisms come back quickly and the diarrhea resolves spontaneously. It was due to Clostridium difficile, but it was self-limited. So the other thing is that antibiotic-associated diarrhea may have other causes. You can also carry Clostridium difficile, as I like to say to students down there in the dark, asymptomatically. I would guess uh, a, a my, sizable minority of us have this organism. Maybe 30% of us have this organism in our intestine now. Then there's the diarrhea that starts, the C. difficile associated diarrhea. And if it's progressive, it'll become pseudomembranous colitis. And it can result in fulminant colitis with toxic megacolon and death. So how do you diagnose antibiotic-associated colitis? Well, you have to demonstrate that the toxins are in the stool. And we do that commonly using an enzyme immunoassay. And we ordinarily submit two specimens and if you do that, the sensitivity is greater than 90%. So we can easily diagnose this. Now, if the diagnosis remains in doubt, or let's say the patient, we know the patient has it, but they're no better, it may be time to do a lower GI endoscopy. And that's where they, we see this pseudomembranous colitis. Now, they call it pseudomembranous colitis. It's a very adherent not pseudomembrane, not a real membrane, composed of white cells and the sloughed 
mucosal epithelium. That's what you're looking at. So how do you then manage antibiotic associated colitis? Well, if the initial episode is mild or moderate, then the white count in the blood may be less than 15,000. They have normal renal function. The treatment is metronidazole. On the other hand, if the initial episode is severe and they've got an elevated white count, they've got an elevated creatinine uh, and they're quite sick, you go ahead and start oral, not IV, but oral vancomycin. Now vancomycin is a cell wall agent active against gram-positive organisms, and this is a gram-positive rod. And the benefit of vancomycin is it only gets gram-positive organisms, so it's not gonna affect any of the others in the intestine that are not gram-positive, and it's not absorbed. So it's not gonna cause any systemic toxicity. So you can, it's a benign drug when you take it orally. It's got its problems when you give it IV. So vancomycin is pretty effective therapy for even a severe initial episode. So let's say that the, it's a severe episode and it's not only severe, but it's complicated by hypotension, shock, ileus, or megacolon. Now we've really got a problem on our hands. And so now we use vancomycin plus metronidazole and if the patient's intestines have stopped working, if they have an ileus, we may have to give vancomycin by rectal enema. Um, so one of the problems with C. diff infections is sometimes they relapse. And if this is their first relapse, we would treat them the same as if the, it was the initial episode. If it's the re second recurrence, We've got to do tricks with the vancomycin, and this is why we do the tricks. We kind of taper and or pulse the vancomycin. So let's say a patient has C. diff in their intestine and we're trying to kill it. Okay, you start vancomycin. Now some of those C. diff will turn from the vegetative form into the spores. Well, they're not gonna be susceptible to vancomycin. So after you stop the vancomycin, those spores germinate, back they come, and back comes another episode. So you can fool the organism by giving vancomycin for a time, waiting till the spores germinate, and hit them again, wait, and then hit them again. That's the idea behind pulsed uh, therapy. Fidaxomycin 200 milligrams twice a day for 10 days can also be used for recurrent cases. What's really promising in the treatment of particularly severe or recurrent C. difficile infection is giving, I know it sounds terrible, a fecal transplant from people who donate normal stool. And the idea is that normal stool contains other bacteria that once they get into the colon will quiet down the growth of C. diff. And uh, initially, the way to give it was not very satisfactory. We'd give it through a colonoscope by retention enema or actually put feces down a nasogastric tube, or there are now some oral capsulized frozen fecal samples that we can give like a pill. And believe it or not, as strange as this might sound, they are highly effective in preventing multiple recurrences. 91% efficacy. So I think the trend now is to figure out a way to do this more uh, aesthetically pleasing. And the things that are uncertain are what actually organisms in feces do the protection. We don't know that. And uh, there are some experimental things by Ceres Health, Ceres 
109. It's a combination of bacterial spores in pill form. And it, it's not ready for prime time, but it's promising for recurrent C. diff infections. So that's a lot about Clostridium difficile, but it needed a lot of discussion because of the importance of this in modern medicine.